Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. ...the counselor, and two students, Joseph and Kara. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Joseph, how are you today? Fine, thanks. And Kara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study and how you are managing your time, OK? Yes. I think so. OK, so I'll start with Kara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socialising? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Kara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about 10 hours more than the average student a week. Think about it, and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at 11.30. OK, good. Come to my office at 11.45 and wait in reception, OK? OK. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socialising through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So, you've managed to integrate well? I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late? No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course, during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work, OK? Yes, 
I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend 90% of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before and, well, we went out afterwards and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation, I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. 
For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people joined bands, each one of which has a theme. For example, the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone, full of color and sound. It's serious, too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to 11-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student, London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about AD 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about 20 foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks. Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising, but you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium, with a variety of programmes, such as aerobics and weight training. If the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative or speak with sports administration manager, Mr Lawrence Cavendish. Now, I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial, physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, 
be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life, as women are prone to osteoporosis. It also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures. And another two or more hours studying, that's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about how adults and babies communicate. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey, and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully, you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario: you're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else, you want to see the mother and baby, and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds, and if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language, which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies. And according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution: walking upright. In contrast to other primates. Humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped, so 
whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest, human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food. To pacify an infant distressed by this separation, the mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of mother ease. As mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles, words emerged from the jumble of sounds and became conventionalised across human communities, ultimately producing language. Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead, they prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists, but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the mother ease theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar. Nor, they say, does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. Most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago. This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in mother ease. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.